so in this uh, conference room is myself, uh, Daniel Sarpon with Xavier University and director of the Community Engagement Corps for La Casse. And uh, we're responsible for the La Casse Community Scholars Program. And what we're doing, and also here is uh, Ms. Tanisha Fields, who is the uh, Community Engagement and Outreach Corps Coordinator. Uh, so um, the two of us were tag team in the presentation. I'll take the lead and she'll chime in as she see fit. And uh, we welcome all questions uh, because part of the goal of this uh, session is to try to answer all your questions that you may have uh, in terms of um, whether you're eligible or not, or, you know, there's really no uh, major restrictions in terms of participating in this mechanism. Uh, so uh, again, uh, the purpose of uh, the uh, LaCasse Community Scholars Program is basically to foster academic and community partnership in promoting community engaged research as part of LACAS research uh, portfolio. I know most of us will agree that there's always the need to uh, establish academic and community partnership and even though we may talk about that, sometimes it doesn't really happen or if it happens, it's not in the nature where uh, both parties feel a mutual benefit or they feel that they're all on the same playing field. So this is LaCat's way of being deliberate in establishing a, an academic and community partnership uh, to uh, engage in, uh, uh, to embark on community engaged research. Uh, this idea is not new to LaCasse, the actual idea was uh, adopted from the Community Engagement Scholars Program by Medical University of South Carolina. We visited there in 09 and we thought that the program was um, a great one so we decided to adopt that but we've since then had two cohorts that have come forth and this RFA would uh, be bringing and it will be used to recruit the third cohort. Uh, the goal here again is to increase capacity of community academic partnership to conduct community engaged research with mutual ownership of the process and products and with the ultimate goal of improving health of residents of Louisiana and in the nation. So that's really the goal of this project. Uh, in terms of the competencies, we want to discuss the concepts and components of community-based participatory research and other methods for community-engaged research. We also want to apply CBPR principles. And again, everybody may be in different uh, stages in terms of application of CBPR. Uh, so again, part of if we're going to really do community-engaged research, then we do need to understand those principles. So part of what we do is incorporate those principles. We also want to implement a pilot community-based participatory initiative with high potential for continued research finding. So we're hoping that this will be a first step uh, to gathering some data, testing the feasibility of your idea in terms of the community um, um, in the community engagement speak, uh, space in terms of research and then maybe leverage that uh, data that you collect then for maybe another pilot project or go for a much bigger grant. So the goal is that we're hoping that this would be a stepping stone or a springboard to uh, other re uh, support in terms of research. So in terms of general information, what makes this a, a unique uh, program is that we have designed it in a way that we're using sort of the NIH uh, mul multiple PI ship uh, mechanism. So we're ho uh, the design of it is that both the academic and the uh, community partners are, are PIs on the project. So there is a community PI and also an academic PI. And so that's really the main 
requirement of this project that both the academic and the community are on the same foot and, and that each one has identified PI on the project. And then uh, basically uh, we have a number of uh, documents. There is some level of commitment that especially if the person who is on the community side is not the person who runs the organization then we want to be able to see both on the academic side and the um, um, community side that there is uh, release time because it involves uh, participation in a didactic session. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. And so up to two teams are going to be awarded um, and also we require that uh, folks who were awarded uh, will participate in a formal training and this formal training basically is always customized. It's, we have some basic things that we cover, especially in the community-based uh, uh, participatory uh, research principles and methods. Uh, but we look at the proposals that were submitted and we look at areas that uh, could be strengthened. So we tailor the uh, formal uh, didactic session based on the pool and the needs of the awardees. The funding is up to 10000 It doesn't fund any um, salaries for the PIs or the key personnel, uh, but this always raises a question. So if I hire a data collector, I, can I pay or can I pay the person? Folks who are directly involved in the project can be paid. It's just that the money is so small that the PIs can't be paid. Uh, bless you, it can be paid from this 10000 We want majority of the money to go into the actual um, implementation of the project. Uh, we have a year for both the didactic section and then the uh, pilot project. Uh, in the past, we used to say th uh, 13 weeks for the didactic section. And partly the role of the didactic session is that uh, we're not looking for a perfect NIH-ready type grant proposal. We're really looking for the idea and if you've actually worked with your community partner where you've identified a need in the community, uh, this project has high um, community relevance. Uh, it addresses a major disparity, health disparity. Then um, the reviewers, if they view it favorably, then it would be uh, funded based on how you score. Uh, but then that didactic session is also the opportunity to actually rewrite and actually strengthen the proposal. So we're not expecting that these are coming in uh, almost well polished, ready to, to go to NIH. But by the end of the didactic session, we believe that uh, based on communication between the community partner and the academic partner and some of the tips that you might get through the training that now you'll be able to uh, reshape uh, the proposal so that uh, it would get the NIH approval. Because we're using NIH dollars, uh, these awards have to get final approval and then the money is released to actually conduct the project, which will be the second phase of this uh, program. Any question up to this point? Hearing none, we'll proceed. So we did say that the curriculum has both a, uh, a didactic session and also an experiential session. The experiential session is, uh, component is basically whereby we would uh, find mentors for you if you need one. Um, we're getting applicants of various stages in the research uh, spectrum, so not all of the individuals are new investigators or junior investigators. But if they are early stage investigators or junior investigators and they might need a mentor, uh, either on, uh, most likely on the academic side or on the community side, then uh, this core would work with you to identify a mentor that would help uh, with um, the implementation of the uh, pilot project. So that's 
part of the uh, experiential component. Um, in terms of the didactic training, some of the potential topics that we've uh, dealt with is typically we have an introductory session. Uh, in the past, we've had it such that it's been very feasible to have um, uh, what you call it, a face-to-face -face meeting. Uh, but we're very flexible. Uh, the preference is that it is good for all the folks in the cohort to be able to meet and network because sometimes you're able to uh, benefit from each other and build other um, network or be able to network and build other relationships. But one of the things we also stress is community and academic partnership in the context of community-based participatory research. And again, the reason is that um, sometimes this is also an opportunity for the community and academic partner to strengthen this relationship. Uh, in the past, we've had some who have been working together, and so it was not there wasn't a need to strengthen that relationship. But at least both partners also understood the needs of each other, where maybe earlier on uh, there were a lot of assumptions going on. Uh, but this is really a good opportunity during this whole training process to really see uh, both partners as equal partners in academic understanding what it takes to engage community uh, without sacrificing the rigor of the science. And then the community understands some of the nuances of research, so therefore they're more accommodating if things are not going as fast as they want to see because a lot of time these timelines and processes are regulated by funding agencies and their requirements and also the fact that you want to maintain the scientific integrity of the project. So even having that understanding is very important. Then we go to the process of making sure that the community partner also has uh, is able to get the um, human protection certification. So we work with the community partner if they're not already, they do not already have like a, a city um, uh, certification for human protection. And then also to begin to work on the IRB application. Uh, we do have a session on grantsmanship. So this is where again, uh, it may be more beneficial for the uh, community uh, partner to understand this whole process and how grants are reviewed um, in, in the NIH and the DHHS space and even uh, with foundations. Uh, we tend to, because it's community-engaged research, uh, we do schedule uh, depending on where uh, the awardees are, if they're in Baton Rouge, we'll schedule for them to present to the Baton Rouge CAP. If they're in the New Orleans area, we would schedule for them to present to the New Orleans CAP. And again, this is a way to help you to get community input before you finalize your, your protocol or your grant application to go to NIH. So uh, we do uh, stress that because we've and, and a number of folks in the previous cohort have said that that's been very useful. Some folks have had to revamp their whole design after this type of engagement and going through some of the CBPR principles. Um, mentorship, again, we mentioned that we do look at diversity, culture, and language uh, because if we're dealing with ethnic minority populations, we need to understand culture and, and and the effect of language in communicating, even in, in the form of recruitment and also dissemination of information. Uh, Health Literacy, we work with the Health Literacy Corps and they provide a workshop uh, to make sure that the information that we use and even the way we structure our informed consent is um, health literate. Um, issues of career development, looking at maybe the next step with this grant in terms of maybe other mechanisms by which um, this could be leveraged for future funding. And then also dissemination is important, both our academic and community uh, partners co-authoring publications, and then evaluation of the program is the last thing. 
uh, some key events and dates, and this is in the RFA, so, uh, but we want to highlight those. Uh, the RFA has already been released. Uh, August 19th was the date. Uh, Today uh, is the informational session. So the next big thing is the uh, deadline for the letter of intent, which is September 6th. Um, and at, on the same day, we also happen to have the CORE's uh, uh, symposium, and we encourage that all of you interested in submitting a letter of intent uh, that you participate or uh, have some representation at the symposium because it's also a, a great place to network and to uh, understand the dynamics of academic, effective uh, dynamics of uh, academic and community partnership in, in their research space. Um, the application deadline is September 30th, um, 5 p.m. Uh, it's been designed where it's submitted uh, through a portal on the uh, La Casa website, so you don't have to email it. If by chance you find that, you know, there's a hiccup on the system, then do email it or something, so at least it's uh, post-dated that you did submit it on time. We wouldn't want you to not have uh, an application in because of um, a hiccup on the system. But so far we've had no, no problems with people submitting the application online. Also with the letter of intent, uh, I'll step back, I'll come back to that and give a little bit more details. Uh, this, the applications are reviewed, it's not even reviewed internally, we solicit um, reviewers from outside. We use external reviewers. Um, this year we're going to go through an orientation with them so that everybody understands. Uh, we use the NIH rubric, but let them understand the needs to look at it from community uh, relevance uh, and not to be reviewing it like they would be reviewing an NIH grant even though we're using uh, the NIH rubric. Uh, to do the evaluation um, and we would inform folks in terms of the status of the application October 18th and then uh, the training starts the week of October 27th. We'll kind of have it as a compressed schedule because we want to get the didactic out of the way and at least by January, early January, have folks starting the uh, um, the uh, pilot project. That's why we recognize that the grant runs from July 1 to June 30th of every cycle. Uh, and we know that uh, six months, it's not enough to complete these pilot projects. So most of the folks have actually got no cost extension and NIH has been very graceful. Great, uh, gracious and approving the no cost extension for folks to complete the project. So stepping back to the letter of intent, uh, there are a couple of forms and all we do with the letter of intent is we don't screen out whether your project would not should not go forth. The only thing we require is that you demonstrate that there is a community and academic partner. So two community organizations cannot submit an application and two uh, partners both academic cannot submit we need to have one academic partner and one community partner um, and with the two PIs and I think um, a form that indicates that whoever the leaders or supervisors are to the applicants uh, assuring that they would grant them permission to be able to uh, participate in the didactic session of the uh, of the program. So I'll pause at this point and see if there are any uh, questions. Um, and we have a whole hour, so we, we might be able to go back if you have specific question or language in the, in a page in a portion of the RFA. I'll do my best to answer it. Any questions at this point? Hi, Dr. Sarpong. This is Dr. Tyre Gross. Um, my question was, how 
many applicants do you usually or how many applications do you usually get every year uh, so the first year we I think we ended up with maybe about 10 applications um, and last year I think we had maybe six or seven applications and we typically will have three reviewers per application um, so I mean last year the numbers were slightly lower than the, fir the first year uh, but I would say somewhere between seven and ten. We're hoping that we'll get more applicants this year, but um, did that answer your question? I apologize, I muted myself. Oh, okay. um, and only two, that answers my question, only two applications will be awarded? Yes, because we only have okay. money for um, so we have a total of 20000 that NIH approved for us to fund this. Now, if we get, let's say, and it's based on, um, and everybody going and understand they have up to 10000 so you don't have to. Uh, if it would take you less than 10000 to fund the project, then that's fine. You could specify. If a, Let's say we assume where the first top three, uh, we could fund all three of them for the 20,000, then we will fund three. But we typically say two because uh, most people, when they say you have up to 10,000, you know how we all do with grants. If it's 500K, we end up with a budget of 499 or something. You know, we're trying to squeeze every penny we can get. So that's the reason why we typically say two, because we know that um, that would be the case. Now we had uh, one very successful story in the first cohort, who actually final budget came out to be 4K, and since then have gone on and done very well, I've gotten large grants from EPA and the like. So. I mean, in that regard, if we end up having the top three and all three can be funded for the 20K, then we would fund all three of them. But right now, I think it's safe to say definitely two at the minimum. As a core, we're trying to look for other alternatives. If we can get some benefactors who would donate uh, to that and we kind of working out some mechanisms to see if we can do that then we can fund maybe more in the future but right now for the NIH dollars we would say we'll fund a minimum of two but uh, depending on how the budgets uh, shape up for the various proposed projects mm -hmm. um, this is Reva I would like to know uh, we are cohort three um, and so do you have a page of cohort one and cohort two and the kind of projects that have been funded and what they have done so you can get an idea of, I know the, you know there are so many things out there that you can reach out to them. So there is on the, uh, if you go to the LACAS website, I think under the community, uh, under the core, uh, and there is a section called the Community Scholars Program. There is a, a yeah. and some information on those who have been funded in the previous uh, cohorts. Okay. So you could, uh, and I think there's some at least email that if you do want to reach out to them, you, w you should be able to do it. Now, one thing I would add is let's say you are a community person, you're eager to do this, uh, but you don't have an academic partner. Um, you know, we know the time is short, but if you let us know ahead of time, we will try and see if we could do a matchmaking for you. Uh, we don't know if it's going to work or not, but we do our best to try and find you somebody that you may be able to partner with, and this might be a uh, start to a very healthy and uh, fulfilling uh, relationship in terms of research. Uh, so, in meeting the needs of your community. And say, similarly, for those in the academic yeah. space, if they're looking for community partners, we'll try and do some matchmaking when, when okay. we can. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome.
any other questions or comments or you know, things you think we could do better or Hi, this is this is Rick Zimmerman at LSU uh, Health Sciences uh, uh, School of Nursing. I wanted to ask about the the training because you know we certainly want to do what's what's required by this program. Uh, could uh, could could different people from the community and uh, academic teams attend some of the different uh, trainings? If if one one or two people can't attend all of them, how do you feel about that? So that is fine. So what we would say is that if, let's say, both party uh, partners have a team, they could use a team approach where if the PIs can make it, maybe somebody on the team can be present. Uh, again, we we want this situation because it's, it's the co-learning, co-teaching approach to right. CBPR. So as long as we have representation from both partners, then at least we know that both partners are getting the same information. So as they dialogue and, you know, strengthen their relationship, that it would be a healthy one in that, you know, we would be truly forging this uh, CBPR um, uh, base type of academic community partnership. Okay, that, that's helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. And some of the, uh, just to also maybe expand on my initial response, we most of this is going to be done virtually, most of the training. Uh, so we have a few that is in person, but because we understand, you know, the dynamics of, you know, even time spent just traveling, uh, we tend to want, uh, do a lot of this thing virtual. So... Uh, a lot of the training, you might be able to just do it from um, your site uh, and not physically coming in. But we do still want to make sure that both the academic and community partners are getting the same information. Any other questions? Um, if your grant is not selected um, for the award, but you're still interested in the training, are those trainings open to um, others? Yes, and that question's come up. So if you want to do the uh, training and uh, you haven't, uh, you weren't selected, yes, you could still benefit from the training. Yes, you can attend the training. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, comments? I want to do a roll call, make okay. sure I have everyone, and then also give them more. They need more details about the symposium. Okay. I think uh, Ms. Fields has something she wants to share with the group, so I yield to her at this point. If there are no more questions, I just wanted to share about the symposium. If you, the Community Engaged Research Symposium that we're hosting on the 6th, Friday the 6th of September, um, from 8 a.m. until 4 p.m. here at Xavier University, uh, it'll be in the Convocation Annex. And if you haven't received a flyer, if you're not a part of the uh, LACATS, you know, member, member institutions, uh, any of the member institutions for LACATS, and you haven't seen a flyer or received any registration, details for this event, please email community at lacats.org um, and just share with me that you um, that you participated in the phone call, um, the, the informational call, and that you would like more information about the symposium, and I will shoot that over to you. So again, that email is community at lacats.org. Um, you can obviously send any questions over there, but definitely if you want more information about the symposium and you're interested in attending, which we would like you to, uh, please email us and we can get those details over to you. Hey, this is Robert of Pennington. I heard, on that, I thought that I read that they were going to be doing trainings in Treeport and Baton Rouge. 
Right, that would be in the future, but the one that's coming up in New Orleans is on the 6th. Uh, we'll be working with the uh, Baton Rouge Cab and the Shreveport Cab to schedule the Baton Rouge one. Um, so, yeah, the, uh, for those in Baton Rouge, uh, I mean, you, you can still, you're still welcome to come here. Uh, we'll make it worth your while if you do choose to come. Uh, but uh, we're going to have one in Baton Rouge and Shreveport at a later date. Those dates have not been fixed yet. Uh, but Miss Fields might have some additional. You want to add something? Yeah, just that there will be online participation available for the New Orleans um, Community Engaged Research Symposium. So if you, um, you know, would like the benefit of coming to this symposium or participating in it, prior to the submission deadline for the letter of intent um, for the Community Scholars Program, then, and if you, you know, don't have the opportunity to travel to New Orleans, that is another opportunity to, um, to participate online. And so once you register, there is the option to, um, to receive information for virtual attendance. Okay, do you have any idea when, that, that's a great option, I appreciate that. Is there, do you have any idea when they might occur in Baton Rouge? Are you thinking 2019, you thinking 2020? Any idea at all? I think it'll most likely be before the end of this year, but uh, again, we have to coordinate it with the uh, Baton Rouge cab and uh, Dr. Betty Kennedy uh, to, and uh, Stephanie Broyles to figure out what would be the best time. Because what we try to do with the symposium in the one in New Orleans is we involved our cab and community members uh, because we wanted their buy-in, their active participants in the symposium. Uh, we'll also be having one of our cohort one uh, recipients also presenting as part of the, on the panel. So we try to make sure that the community in the space where we're offering these uh, symposium are engaged. Um, so. That's why we can't give you a definitive date, but uh, Betty and Stephanie are definitely looking at when it would be feasible to um, uh, pull it off in Baton Rouge, and then the next one would be in Shreveport. But definitely uh, for Shreveport, it most likely will be 2020. Baton Rouge is possible. We'll do it before the year is out, but again, it depends on the operations on the ground. Uh, but if you, and again, for all those of you on the call, if, you know, for one reason or the other, you know, you um, want to continue to uh, solicit uh, the course assistance in terms of, you know, identifying a community partner, even if it's not for, in response to this RFP or RFA, uh, but maybe for a future uh, idea that you have. Uh, we're here to serve, um, service your needs. So you can always reach out to us and we'll do our best uh, to either link you with resources in the community or, or help you with the in-house expertise that we have. So again, we don't want you to feel like, you know, if you didn't participate in responding to this RFA, then that's the end of the relationship. You can always call on us. And, um, so. I know it's at, almost at the end of the day, and I, we appreciate it. If there are no other questions or comments, um, we, uh, we're looking forward to your application and your involvement. Uh, we look forward to seeing you on September 6th. Um, and even after th this afternoon, if you still have questions, yeah, I would say shoot me an email, but I think you'd do better uh, shooting Ms. Fields an email and we'll be responsive to your needs and uh, help you any way you can to be responsive to the RFA. Uh, so we thank you for your time, uh, and we ask that you stay safe and with this weather, and uh, we look forward to our continued relationship. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sarpon. Okay.